Good day everyone. Greetings of peaceful, prosperous, and of course healthy day to all of you. I'd like to congratulate the UST Alumni Association and this powerful committee behind the Academ Alumni and Industry Government Collaboration Project uh, which brings together the four major pillars of the educational system to transform it towards a better normal, not just the new normal. And there are three things that we can do together, not just in this summit, in the classroom, but, but also in the offices that we're in. The first one really is about falling in love with the subjects that we're passionate about. Because falling in love in those subjects allows us to contribute and be complementing one another. The second thing that we can do is really about communicating, engaging, and actively participating in the discourse. And maybe last point really is, it is important the leadership skills of empathy, listening, finding your own purpose, communicating, and collaboration continue to be an important and fundamental part of the education system that we have, but also a very important part of the society that we continue to live. If Education 4.0 is how we should help transition our students to Industry 4.0, then it must also be a purposeful transformation to the learning experience by emphasizing to students, faculty members, and school administrators to take on challenges head on. This summit, which we started in 2019, is an important down payment for that transition. And we thank the UST Alumni Association and its partners for underwriting that uh, down payment and we all have roles to play, will be paid by experimenting together, sharing knowledge, welcoming new partners, and by harnessing the actions of the academic alumni industries and governments. As our nation progresses in this battle against the pandemic, extraordinary collaborations between all stakeholders need to be instituted. Through partnerships and collaborations, stakeholders from all sectors of the society unite towards the improvement of education with our learners at the core of our collective societal transformation. Our universities and colleges will continue to serve their mandates to advance knowledge through teaching and research and will continue to democratize technical expertise to their respective immediate communities. While our higher education institutions uphold these mandates, the Commission also secures its directive of coordinated partnerships with all the sectors of our society. May I encourage my fellow alumni in the UST and all our colleagues from the academy to advocate and look into pursuing and offering TVET qualifications in your institutions, especially in your engineering programs and architecture. We need the practical side of TVET in order to produce well-rounded engineering professionals. We have to reskill and upskill existing workers and new entrants to the world of work for them to be able to bounce back. This is also our contribution to the MSMEs and of course to the national employment strategy, revitalization of employment. As the world of work is drastically changing, shifting to remote or hybrid forms of work, so does the web need to be transformed as well. Tibet delivery should focus on industry and academic partnership and collaboration. Our educational institutions should fill two other roles. One is research and development of new technologies, products, and services. This is woefully lacking in our Philippine educational institutions today. The second is to be a stimulus for the growth and development of the communities around it. It is imperative that we restructure our education system immediately. We cannot stand still. We must redouble our efforts to shorten the gap or even overtake the other countries. So let me just emphasize that investments in new technologies, digitalization and innovation our investments on resilience, sustainability, competitiveness, and long-term business growth, which are all necessary as we enter 
our economy, economic recovery. Together, let us help create a strong manufacturing industry. And by manufacturing, I also include industry and services that will build back better a more competitive and innovative Philippines, as envisioned by our President Rodrigo Roa III. We have to practice multi-stakeholder collaboration to enable the digital readiness of our learnings. This is what we have learned in practicing sustainability. The problems that we have are so big that we cannot do it alone. And so what we need to do is to partner and collaborate with other uh, institutions, even corporates, that have the, the knowledge and that have the resources to help. And with this partnership, we will be able to address some, if not all, of the problems that are facing us in the sector. We really experience the, the hardships of the, the education sector, especially the administrators' survival. We are partner of the government in nation building, and we hope that the, the government will continue to assist us, especially in facilitating our students to continue their studies amidst the pandemic. And also we need cooperation between parents, students, and other stakeholders in the academy. First, I think education must move with the digital world. No doubt about it. Now, let's take this opportunity in this pandemic not to revolutionize education to EdTech. And I, I think educators in schools like the USD should be the prime mover here. Now, Remember, technology is an enemy. You know, the, the, it's not intended actually to replace no? uh, teachers, but really to enhance learning. No? So the role of technology is to enhance rather than replace human teachers' capabilities and human interaction. Uh, if there is one thing that this pandemic had taught us, and you know what is that? It has made us realize that there are many pathways towards learning. And personally, I'm always an advocate of moving away of too much structure and too much formality in teaching and learning. Because if we give so much focus on that, much of the time what we are doing is just a compliance and not a real joy of teaching and learning. So we need to think together in order to uh, shape the future that we want. And we want to achieve education that heals, repairs, repurposes, and renews. So these are the things that we look, we look at having uh, that ecosystem that really works to transform the kind of education that we need. Because the only way that we are going to solve these problems is with empowered global publics around the world. And the only way those publics can be empowered is if we have highly functioning educational systems that give people the tools, not just to learn, which is critically important, but to learn, to engage, to be citizens of their countries, to be informed citizens of the world. Toward this end, we manifest our collective appreciation to the organizers of this webinar series in forging strategic pathways for our academe, alumni industry, and government to come together for a common good, a desire to create transformative and transforming educators in our midst. Especially, we manifest the following belief statements to the ideals as expressed in AAIG's manifestation of solidarity from the various education stakeholders. Yung amin pong isinusulong na magpatuloy pong mangarap ang ating mga anak, kolehiyo man o sa high school o elementarya, ay pwede pa rin pong mangyari dahil ang kanila pong pangarap ay pwedeng mangyari dahil sa pagpapatuloy po ng ating edukasyon sa gitna ng pandemya ito. Mabuhay po kayo Mabuhay po ang University of Santo Tomas Alumni Association. Mabuhay po ang kabataang Filipino. Salamat po.
It takes a village to raise a child. Alone, we can do so little. Together, we can do so much. Coming together is a beginning. Staying together is progress. And working together is success. Effectively, change is almost impossible without industry-wide collaboration, cooperation, and consensus. These are just some of the powerful statements that have inspired so many through the years to come together and be united to surf upon the waves of changes and transitions. The pandemic more so has amplified the message that we are closely interconnected and interdependent and that we have to work together to move forward together as a community, as a country, and as a people. This very activity exemplifies and best demonstrates a synergy among stakeholders and sectors of the society. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Academe Alumni Industry and Government Visayas Caravan 2022 with the theme, Strengthening Approaches Towards the Preferred Future. My name is Joshua Soldivillo and I'm from Suleiman University. I will be your guide for today's event. And once again, welcome to the AAIG 2022 Caravan Series for the Visayas. This Zoom meeting is streamed via Facebook Live at the Facebook pages of UST AAI and Suleiman University. That's today, September 30, 2022. I'm glad to welcome our speakers and our distinguished guests who shall be formally introduced in the succeeding segments. A big thanks to all our participants in the Zoom call and those watching us via Facebook Live. We would like to thank our main sponsor for this caravan, Rex Education. And of course, all the members of the organizing committee and the partners to make our event today incredibly possible. We are all excited, thrilled, and ready to listen. But it's the best way to begin today's caravan with a mind and heart filled with gratitude, with hands holding an empty cup to gain new insights through an opening prayer to be led by the Suleiman University Church Senior Pastor, Reverend Jonathan Pia. Let's pay respect after which the Philippine flag as we sing the national anthem, Lupang Hinirang. Let us pray. Almighty and our loving God, we turn to you today with eager and grateful hearts. You whose thoughts are above our thoughts and whose ways are above our ways, we praise your name. We come to you today knowing of your goodness and the wonderful strength of your outstretched arms. We can confront life with faith, courage, and fortitude, knowing that you have yet more wonderful things to break forth out of the treasury of your promise whenever we are ready to receive your goodness. As we start the 2022 Academ Alumni Industry Government Caravan Series, we ask that you guide the speaker so that they be able to share their knowledge and expertise. Open the minds and the hearts of the participants so that they can learn new insights and continue to grow in their knowledge so they can become effective advocates champions and community of practitioners helping the respective communities. Guide us all that the things we do can help us find ways to serve those around us so that they may glorify your name. May our endeavors bring about your presence in our midst. And all this we pray in the name of Jesus who is our Christ. Amen. Bayang makiliw, perlas ng silanganan, halab ng puso sa dibdib mo'y buhay. Lupang hinirang, luyan ka ng magiting, sa manluluti, di ka pasisil, sa lahat ng puso. 
Esteemed members of the University of Santo Tomas Alumni Association Incorporated with the UST Graduate Center for Continuing Professional Education and Development. Colleagues in the academe, our guest speakers, the attendees, ladies and gentlemen, a pleasant day to all of us. First and foremost, let me congratulate everyone for holding this Academe Alumni Industry Government or AAIG Caravan Series. Indeed, the aim to stimulate the emergence of AAIG advocates, champions, and a community of practitioners through a collaborative effort among alumni, government agencies, higher education, and industry is laudable. Silliman University is extremely honored to be invited as a partner in this endeavor and given a chance to host the Visayas leg of this caravan. Like any institution, we here at Silliman value our alumni and we partner with the government, higher institutions, and the industry 
as we always believe that every partnership has a driving force that pushes us to be more productive, resilient, and vigorously aim for something for the good of the community. As a community, Silliman University values our alumni, for they have been so generous to their alma mater, extending help in all forms. Likewise, we value our faculty and staff and our students as we instill in them the values of building competence, character, and faith. A leading Christian institution, Silliman University is committed to total human development for societies and the environment's well-being. Thus, hosting the Visayas leg for the AAIG 2022 series is another feather in our cap as we continue to partner with other institutions for the well-being of the wider Silliman community. Let us learn and enjoy as we listen to our guest speakers' presentations today and be advocates for a better future. Welcome to the Campus by the Sea. another feather on our cap and uh, thank you very much for your message and joining us today to give us a glimpse and to further enlighten us with the what and why of AAIG we shall now hear important messages from the two of our distinguished guests please welcome Professor Inocencia Ida Tionco Vice President of USC AAI and Dr. Fe Hidalgo former Under Secretary and the OIC Secretary of the Department of Education. Definitely, this is the day the Lord has made. I am so inspired by the welcome remarks that was given by our host this morning. A pleasant good morning to the school administrators, faculty, and attendees from Suleiman University led by Dr. Betty McCann, and the other schools and institutions in these regions and other regions that are attending as well. Warm, warmest greetings to all our AAIG champions, advocates and partners present here today. It has been a year since the huge success of the second AAIG 2021 webinar series entitled National Multi-Sectoral Summit for Educational Transformation, an academe, alumni, industry, government collaboration that was held from September to October 2021. This was conducted by the UST Alumni Association Incorporated in partnership with the UST Graduate School for Continuing Professional ed Education and Development. The first AAIG caravan was hosted early last July 12, 2022, by the University of Santo Tomas Office of the Vice Rector for Academic Affairs. The second one was conducted last August 5, 2022, for Region 1 and the Cordillera Administrative Region, and hosted and led by our local convener, the Don Mariano Marcos State. University La Union. The third caravan was held last September 16, 2022 for Region 4 and the Calabar Zone hosted by Faith Colleges. Now, here we are gathered today in our growing commitment to journey together towards the emergence of an AAIG community of champions, advocates, and partners for transformative education from Industry 4.0 towards a human-centric Industry 5.0. In this light, I wish to welcome you all as we embark on this fourth caravan of our 2022 
a AIG caravan series for Region 6, 7, 8, the Visayas, entitled Strengthening Approaches Towards a Preferred Future, graciously hosted by our convener, the Siliman University. Cognizant of the multiple challenges that thousands of our fresh graduates experience in search for a rewarding and meaningful employment, and career in the world of work. The idea of AAIG collaboration for educational transformation was born in 2019. To better appreciate this AAIG endeavor, let us get to know more about it. AAIG stands for Academe, Alumni, Industry, and Government coming together to forge strategic alliances and partnerships to establish a common, innovative, and collaborative approach that is sustainable and inclusive to bridge and lessen the gaps in the transmission from the academe to the industry of fresh alumni, thus promoting a smooth, motivating, and productive school-to-work transition by implementing a work-based learning continuum. A sterling quality feature of AAIG collaboration is to harness the roles of the so-called alumni power. Power stands for partnerships, organizations, will, expertise, resources. Indeed, let us not set aside alumni power, but we need to recognize the formidable role it can play since the alumni of our academic institutions are the same human resources that now power and will power our industries, the academe, and the government as well. It is hope that as we forge strategic alliances for alumni-centric initiatives, we can nurture new ways of thinking, communicating, doing, and being in the midst of global challenges, especially as we transition in life beyond COVID-19 pandemic. AAIG is advancing sustainability and responsible manner by allowing the public and private sectors to proverbially shake hands and pledge together for the common good for transforming change, catalyzing strategic partnerships, building cutting edge skills and competencies and rehumanizing education. And so I wish to welcome you again, our champions, our advocates, our partners to our webinar. A pleasant day to all. The AAIG Caravan 2022 series is about coming together towards meaningful public and private partnerships, as mentioned before. It is coming together of hopes and of dreams, coming to life for all those involved in education, in policymaking, and implementation. It is the beginning of a more progressive initiative or initiatives for development. This is towards productive partnerships and networks in the immediate future and in the long term for progress and development of this beloved country. AAIG is anchored on the belief that education must serve society as an instrument for fostering the creation, the advancement, and dissemination of knowledge in the midst of an industry 4.0 stage. 
and even beyond. And that requires skills for renewed focus on life skills, on career skills. The digital literacies call for higher order thinking, for initiatives and inventive thinking as well from all of us. AAIG is cognizant of the triple goals of equity, of career and life skills, and inventive thinking, as I mentioned earlier. This is not only a listening moment, but a coming together and a springboard for collaborative efforts towards more action, as Dr. Henry Tenedoro puts it. AAIG shall endeavor to enable our children to attain the fullest realization of their potentials, their dreams, and our dreams. This is a huge task, huge task, but it is time for us to come together and move our talk in the spirit of collaboration. Please hop in, therefore. Welcome, Welcome. and good morning, morning everyone. everyone. Thank you very much, Professor Tionko and Dr. Hidalgo for your informative sharing. And I can't really help myself but take note of the word power shared to us by Professor Tionko, no? the partnership, the organizations, the will, the expertise, and resources. I think that's a very beautiful way to put things together. At this point, ladies and gentlemen, let us welcome Mr. Don Timothy Buhain, the CEO of Rex Education, our major sponsor for this caravan series for his message. Quality education is often viewed as a stepping stone to employment. Yet year after year, graduating students face the daunting task of adapting to an ever-changing landscape of career and recruitment. While the trial by fire may initially seem formidable, it's not meant to be dismaying because it is not meant to be undertaken alone. This can be witnessed in how alumni, academics, industries, and governments work tirelessly to cultivate spaces where each graduate has the opportunity to thrive. It is truly an honor to be able to say that Rex is part of this collective. For our seven decades, Rex has been steadfast in its commitment to advancing lifelong learning for every Filipino. Our humble beginnings can be traced back to selling and publishing books for basic and tertiary level law and professionals, establishing Rex as a pioneer in the educational publishing industry, developing books and other learning materials continue to be part of our core solution. Now, in response to the changing needs of our learners, we support education in all forms and provide 21st century learning solutions. Educators, learners, and parents alike can trust Trex to develop assessment tools, digital learning solutions, and experiential solutions reflective of the current times. A big part of crafting these solutions entail constant communication and collaboration. Ensuring quality education for all demands a whole of society approach, which is why I am a firm believer in the importance of events such as these. To have AAIG sparking conversation on the state of our system is non-negotiable in helping us achieve our mission. Inspire every individual to advance oneself, 
uplift others, and sustain the environment to a better world. As fresh graduates and young alumni endeavor to practice their professions and vocation, we, members of the AAIG, exist at the forefront of building transformative educative communities for them. In many ways, it is our moral obligation to ensure that students are able to transition seamlessly to the world of work, despite the disorder and disturbances that at times plague the field. Rex is devoted to working jointly with fellow champions of education. The, AI, the AAIG caravan is a step in that direction. To all our educators, school leaders, and partner educampions who are here with us today, thank you for championing education and advancing the industry for the learners of today and tomorrow. Welcome to the AAIG 2022 Caravan Series. It is my hope that this partnership is an unceasing one and that we can continuously come together to discuss what more we can do for the learners who are transitioning to this crucial stage of our lives. As we always say at Rex, para sa bata, para sa mamamayan, para sa bayan. Thank you. in for that message and again our biggest thanks to Rex Education for being our main sponsor for this caravan series and I really love the statement of Mr. Buhuayan when he said that it's really the AAIG's moral obligation to allow students to transition to the world of work in a seamless fashion. And I also like the term Edo Campions. Happy to be part of that. Thank you so much, Mr. Buhain. Papunta pa lang tayo sa exciting part. I know that one of the reasons why you chose to be with us this morning is because of the lineup of speakers we have for this caravan series. And indeed, without any mark of doubt, they have contributed in one way or the other significant initiatives to the sector they are representing and part of today. So without further ado, allow me to introduce to you our first speaker. Dr. Betsy Joy B. Tan best fits the description of the term woman empowerment. She held a position of authority, influence, and responsibility. While she was Vice President for Academic Affairs in Suleiman University, she kept the academic division in sync with the strategic plan of the university, particularly with respect to accreditation, updated curricula, faculty development, and the university's continuing ability to conform to national and international standards, as well as that of the leading transition implementation group in ensuring the smooth transitions into the K-12 and higher education reforms in the university. As Professor Emeritus, she continues to teach in the graduate program of Suleiman University. Dr. Tan's rich experience stems from her several involvements in the country and abroad. Her fuller appreciation of the university's operations can also be attributed to her various engagements in Silliman, from being a dorm matron to a teacher to psychology department prof professor and chairperson to being Center of Excellence College of Education Dean to faculty evaluation coordinator to the director of instruction and the vice president for a academic affairs she held for about 15 years. In the pursuit of quality education at the national level, she became the chairman of the board of directors of the Association of Christian Schools, Colleges, and Universities, an accre accrediting agency incorporated, and the current president of the Federation of Accrediting Agencies of the Philippines, while continuing to be an accreditor of the Philippine Accrediting Association of Schools,
colleges and universities. Dr. Tan completed special trainings on ICEP trainers training at the University of the Philippines, Los Baños, Laguna, awarded by Evelio Javier Foundation, systematic training for effective parenting conducted by the Philippine Mental Health in Manila, seminar on trauma awareness and recovery or START program sponsored by the Eastern Mennonite University at Virginia, and educational manager's training in Brisbane, Australia, awarded by the EDPI TAF Australia. She has been a visiting scholar of the UBCHEA or the United Board for Christian awarded by the British Council. She had her postdoctoral and in curricular innovations, whole person education with Calvin College at Michigan, and in partnership opportunities with the 16 academic institutions in the East Coast, Mid Atlantic, Midwest areas of the United States. Dr. Tan is married to retired RTC judge Rafael Crescenzo Tan Jr., with whom she has two lovely daughters and four grandchildren. Ladies and gentlemen, and other members of the spectrum, Dr. That there is immense power when a group of people with similar interests gets together to work toward the same goals. Additionally, Henry Ford's words succinctly describe AAIG's young and developing life. Coming together is a beginning. Staying together is progress, and working together is success. Esteemed leaders and members of AAIG, my brothers and sisters in faith, happy productive day. My topic assignment, accreditation, a key driver in AAIG partnership Given the theme, strengthening approaches towards the preferred future, sparks a number of questions, but let me focus on two. What is with or in accreditation that can make it a key driver in AAIG partnership and how? Synonymous to the concept of accreditation, our notions of internal and external quality assurance, continuous quality improvements, continuing self and peer assessment and evaluation, commonly accepted standards of quality and excellence. In the academe, accreditation primarily aims to improve educational or academic quality and public accountability. In the industry, accreditation can promote a culture of quality and safety. Accreditation enables organizations, including alumni and government, to identify strengths and weaknesses of programs and procedures. Accreditation can promote communication and empowerment across the AAG partnership and in this context of partnership, in light of the theme of this forum, strengthening approaches towards the preferred future, accreditation is viewed as a key driver. As the current president of the Federation of Accreditation Agency in the Philippines, I strongly affirm this view. Indeed, Accreditation can be a key driver in AAIG partnership, a catalyst that can foster progress as you stay together and promote success as you work together. Accreditation is characterized by a prevailing sense of a partnership. There is a sense of volunteerism in that move. When invited, an organization or an institution makes the choice whether to join or not. The self-regulation that each institution exercises is not exclusive or arbitrary. Self-regulation is governed by a set of quality framework and standards that are commonly accepted by all members of an accreditation agency. 
Accreditation relies on evaluation techniques as there is no other way of determining quality of service or performance but by assessing and passing judgment based on agreed upon parameters. Certainly, by its nature, there is no point in accreditation if quality and excellence are not the smallest immense power to achieve those goals. According to IDOO Koyonikan, you are partners. The OECD lead 2006 Guide to Successful Partnerships describes partners as the stones on which a prosperous development, local, regional, national, international can be built. And their adhesive mortar is the trust. Trust is the cornerstone in every relationship and they can build among themselves as partners. It can be safely assumed that partnerships aim for excellent quality of success in all endeavors. The binding force then between accreditation and partnership is excellent quality. Accreditation thrives on setting high standards of quality through strict evaluation procedures. These standards are clustered in specified areas and they're given accreditation framework. For private educational institutions in the Philippines, AXCU, AXI, PAASCU, and PACOCOA are the accreditation agencies that DepEd and CHED recognize. Another agency, AACUP, is for the state colleges and universities. The presentation of quality standards, areas, and frameworks of accreditation in these accreditation agencies may slightly vary, but they are basically similar. Frameworks are generally three-pronged. First, strategic and systemic quality assurance, or QA. Second, process quality assurance. And the third, results. Under strategic and systemic quality assurance are the areas on leadership and governance, quality assurance systems, and resource management. Process quality assurance includes teaching and learning, student services, external relations, and research. The results area encompasses educational results, community engagement, and service results, research results, and financial and competitiveness results. This is from Paasco Primer. Clustered in each area are the quality standards. Now let me go back to the idea that excellent quality is the binding force between accreditation and partnership, in which partnership aims for excellent quality of success in all its endeavors to accelerate innovations and open markets, writes in Forbes San Francisco Business Council. She asserts, success is not a coin toss. In other words, success is driven by intentionality and willingness. Actors, participants, partners need to work out success. What and Paul advances 10 guideposts for success in her article, Better Together. The 10 ingredients of successful partnerships. These are first, alignment of vision and values. Second, alignment of business objectives. Third, effective governance and metrics. Fourth, collaborative leadership. Fifth, value creation. Six, joint business planning. Seventh, trust and commitment to mutual gain. Eighth, transformative flexibility. Ninth, collaborative competence. And tenth, collaborative mindset. These ingredients are discernible in the following description of the program of work when establishing partnership and successful partnerships. A guide 
published by the OECD Lead Forum on Partnerships and Local Governance. Partnerships need to develop a long-term strategy if they are to work effectively and have a lasting effect. For area-based partnerships, suppose AAIG is, this strategy must include a vision for the region, focusing on the outcome to be achieved, an action plan, identifying shorter-term priorities, and a coordinated working program, including activities and measures that will continue to the achievement of long-term outcomes. Also necessary are a shared commitment to implement the program and arrangements for monitoring and reporting progress. Some relevant characteristics are as follows. The working program is based on a concerted strategy and on a comprehensive analysis of overriding problems, as well as an assessment of local needs and a consultation process with local actors. It should be ambitious as well as realistic. Common objectives are also determined and it should be determined. Targets are set and are clearly defined. The strategy, the objectives and targets and the working program following from them are reviewed and revised at regular intervals, taking into account partners' experiences as well as changes in context. Program targets are compatible with relevant strategic documents, that is, European or national programs and guidelines, regional models. The various measures and projects are planned and correspond to the strategy and to local and regional needs. The nature of cooperation within the partnership is described within the program of work. Much more, budget responsibilities, including different financial sources, are also specified in the program and illustrated with budget tables. Extension of the field of activities is possible where necessary through ch changing the partnership conditions and framework, legal, financial, economic, and institutional. Measures for permanent monitoring and evaluation are planned public relations activities, and a clear external reporting system are planned. And this is from OECD LEAD 2006. Having common vision, values, and goals obtained with quality and excellence through collaborative cooperation, consultation, planning, and strategizing Implementing programs of work, setting clear monitoring and evaluation procedures, reflecting on what works, what doesn't, and why these characteristics largely define partnerships. In conclusion, my dear friends, I will highlight the idea of excellence, which is often thought of as a skill development area. However, Dr. Kenneth Boa, President of Reflections Ministries and Trinity House Publishers, considers excellence as a destination, a preferred future, if you may, because it is a process that we learn and seek to continually improve, he adds. In the foregoing discourse, we can see that excellence is the flagship destination of accreditation. Excellence in their success is also the flagship destination of the AAG or the AIG partnership. Accreditation strives for excellence in many ways, 
periodic review and revision of standards and procedures to accommodate and address the demands of the new normal is one major way. Validating themselves against and affiliating with internationally recognized quality assurance organizations or networks such as the ACAN. On the other hand, this forum that you are conducting at the moment manifests your commitment to stay together for progress and work together for success. Together, you have immense power that enables you to forge ahead and attain your preferred future. Picture the old but trusted broomstick. Without a doubt, accreditation and partnership have an enzymatic relationships. Yes, enzymatic relationships. One causes the other for certain action. Indeed, Accreditation can take you there. Sakai na! Thank you. Wow! Sterling sharing, Dr. Betsy Joy uh, Tan. Indeed, no? Sakai na. And uh, I think I, I got a lot of uh, thoughts on that. And if I may share a few of them, accreditation indeed creates a sense of confidence in our education system. And I like the emphasis that it's more than ensuring quality and abiding the standards, but it's also about taking into account the consequence, asking the question, what's next? And hence, accreditation is a crucial measure of sustainability among schools and colleges. And I love how we should use our foresight to that preferred destination, which is excellence. And Dr. Tan, I love the word enzymatic relationships. Very well. I love that much. Anyway, thank you again to our speaker, first speaker, the president of the Federation of Accrediting Agencies in the Philippines, Dr. Betsy Joy Tan. Reminders for our participants after each guest speaker, please don't forget to write down your questions for each speaker at the Q&A box. We will collect these and address them during the plenary insightful session. There you go, ladies and gentlemen, that's still our first speaker yet. We're already poured with a lot of inspiring, motivational, and insightful messages. Without further ado, allow me to introduce our second speaker. Myrish Kadapan Antonio is a multidisciplinary trisector professional with a strong track record in litigation, advocacy, program design and management as a non-profit senior leadership for over 20 years. Myrish has served as a senior director for fellowships and global initiatives at the Ligatom Center for Development and Entrepreneurship at MIT, the director of fellowship and leadership development programs at the HK Center for Public leadership or CPL that's for six years where she led a team in designing and implementing programs for more than 130 graduate fellows from across the world on principled effective public leadership and was the women and public policy programs interim executive director from January to May 2021. Before coming to HKs and MIT, Myrish was an experienced tri-sector professional for almost 20 years working in various capacities in the private, public, and nonprofit spaces. Her private sector positions include as a deputy legal counsel of uh, Siliman University, among the Philippines' top institutions of higher learning and the director of the Dr. Jovito R. Salonga Center for Law and Development while serving as faculty member of the College of Law. A senior... Partner at Ed Law Office, engaged in premier corporate legal practice in the Philippines. She's also served as corporate secretary for various corporations, engaged in business and entrepreneurship. She also served as an elected local legislator in the Philippines, leading social innovation programs for women, children, environmental protection and preservation, solid waste management, 
regulatory mechanisms, small business support, and ethical leadership. She currently serves on the board of the Harvard Club of the Philippines Global and Save One Life, an international nonprofit serving children with hemophilia in developing countries worldwide. She holds a degree in political science and a Juris Doctor, both from Suleiman University, a Master's of Laws in Government Procurement from the George Washington University Law School as a Fulbright Scholar, and a Master in Public Administration from the Harvard Kennedy School, receiving the Vernon and uh, awards for academic excellence and significant contribution to the Harvard Kennedy School community. Myrish has been widely recognized for her excellence and leadership. Among them is the 2017 Silliman University Law Alumni Award, the 2019 Outstanding Silimanian Award in Global Leadership, the 2019 Harvard Kennedy School Dean's Award, and the 2019 Heroes Highest Staff Award for Harvard University. Ladies and gentlemen, Attorney Myrish Kadapan Antonio, the Senior Director of the Fellowships and Global Initiatives Ligatum Center for Development and Entrepreneurship, MIT. Attorney Myrish. Good day from this side of the world. Greetings from New England, where the fall foliage has begun. I wish I had the opportunity to show to you the magnificent display of colors as you drive through the five states uh, of this part of the world. I am Mayra Antonio. I'm a proud Silimanian, a graduate of Bachelor of Arts in Political Science and Bachelor of Laws from this wonderful university. And I am delighted to share my thoughts on strengthening partnerships and collaboration for inclusive success. I wanted to begin by just grounding us in something very obvious that you all already know and the reason why you all have got gathered. That inclusive success in education is really the conglomeration of efforts from various sectors and use their resources to serve the public good. One way of accomplishing institutional goals in this environment is actually by forging partnerships and collaborations. These partnerships and collaborations bring resources from the university and other organizations, industry or business, other institutions, governments, not-for-profits, alumni together to achieve goals that would be difficult or impossible to do independently. University partnerships are ubiquitous, diverse, and certainly not new. However, the confluence of state disinvestment in higher education combined with myriad economic, political, and demographic challenges confronting states as well as countries and the rise of the pandemic have increased the scope and intensity of partnership across the university community. There are various types of partnerships and collaborations that exist worldwide, also very much evident in the Philippines. One are those community partnerships, including and significantly with alumni, parents, and other members of the community with a variety of both economic and non-economic goals, maybe fundraising for a school project or other non-economic goals like recruitment and scholarships. And then partnerships between and among other educational institutions, such as this one, is very much evident. And a broad collection of arrangements between the business sector industry and universities. I will say from, from my vantage point here in Boston, um, as far as consortia is concerned, uh, number two, Students from actually Tufts, Harvard, and MIT can cross-register to any of uh, the courses across all three universities, both in the undergrad and graduate school. And then from where I live, which is very close to the Harvard Business School, Harvard actually owns 70% of the land in Alston here in Boston, but they have been very thoughtful about engaging local stakeholders as they plan for the land development. 
partnerships can provide numerous benefits for public and private institutions, such as providing resources to speed the completion of a key campus project. These collaborations can also free up the university's resources from activities that are not central to its mission while providing outside expertise to help the university achieve its goals. And for alumni to somehow feel connected to the mission of the institution that has impacted your life and made you who you are today. Partnerships can also create opportunities for research and learning experiences for faculty, staff, and students, and help build relationships leading to employment opportunities for students and alumni. And lastly, partnerships can create avenues for universities and colleges to deliver unified impact on their mission as stewards of space. Some reality check. Partnerships and collaboration are imperative, but let's not forget that there are risks involved in these arrangements. The risk of failure of you know, coming together of several entities that can bring material and reputational risk. Not to be afraid, not a fear rumor monger, but just to make us all realize it is important that we proactively plan to mitigate these risks as we see them through. So risk analysis and scenario planning must be central to the deliberative process of the partnership or collaboration between and among entities, performing due diligence and anticipating potential pitfalls. Obviously, as human beings, we cannot anticipate everything, but due diligence is imperative. And then if there are any tax implications, laws and regulations, as well as state agencies involved, it is important for the legal department to be part of the process from its inception. I uh, found this in uh, one of the papers of AXCO, which is the American Association of Colleges and Universities. Uh, and I thought it can be contextualized to the Philippines because so much of how we engage in collaborations and partnerships also involve this process. There is an initial analysis, a profiling of entities involved, a mapping of skills, uh, an asset mapping of what, what skills exist between and among uh, those who are coming to the table and what gaps there exist uh, so that they can complement each other in what's gonna happen. What are academic credentials that are both there and needed? Talent development, an updated curriculum, a development uh, that will engage industry, and finally, integrating high impact practices. So this entire model, although from a US perspective, I thought would be important to share with you guys as it's, it also applies to what we do in the Philippines. There are several principles uh, for successful partnerships and um, a number of factors, characteristics, and um, principles to make the partnerships and collaboration work between and among entities, whether all four sectors, the academia, um, other universities, alumni, government, and industry are concerned or between and among similar sectors. I will not read all of what you've seen in the slide, but suffice for it for me to point out that partnerships and collaboration, just like any human relationship, requires a substantial investment of time. It doesn't happen overnight. You meet this one day, and then tomorrow you'll have a very successful partnership. It takes time. It takes time to frame the relationship, it takes time to also define the terms and, and uh, what effective collaboration means to both of you. It's important to know who you're engaging with, even if that institution is very popular or well-known, it's just very important. Stakeholder analysis, stakeholder engagement, very important. Um, alumni, students, you know, faculty, staff, as you know, and consultation with all relevant governing boards, 
And then important that it has to be ensured that this aligns with the mission. Otherwise, you will not only run counter to regulatory agencies, but also to mission drift, right? And, and that will weaken your strength as an institution. Understand each other's motivations. Why are you coming to the table? Understand the politics of it all. I mean, come on, the optics of a partnership is also important. How do you measure results? What does success look like or mean for each of you? And as I mentioned earlier, while you can proactively think about the potential risks that can happen in the partnership, you must remain flexible because the human mind is finite and cannot envisage all possible cases and scenarios that may happen in the moment. That's what COVID has taught us so much. And then finally, because not all partnerships and collaborations work despite your best efforts, have an exit strategy so you are prepared when that time comes. Unfortunate time. I wanted to just delve a little bit on uh, a topic that's close to my heart and I think the reason why I'm brought in and that is related to specifically alumni engagement as a means for partnership and collaboration. And alumni is what makes the base for, I think, a very strong reputation of universities. Uh, sometimes it is underestimated the extent to which the value of alumni engagement uh, is seen across the globe. But I would say there are very few universities I've studied extensively in the US, in Australia, in Europe. Uh, there are very few that I feel come close to the kind of spirit of alumni engagement that Silliman has really nurtured in each of us. Um, I see it uh, in, in certain respects at Harvard. People also come, come to the reunions. Uh, it's very well attended, but the Silliman spirit is really something else, I must say. So some best practices that I want to share to the rest of the audience today, and I, I think for my fellow Silimanians as well. Uh, one is it's important when you engage alumni that they have a home when they come visit to relieve that experience that has you know, really impacted their lives significantly, but also made them who they are. You might underestimate the value of a smooth process for alumni in terms of transcript acquisition, diploma requests, yearbook reprinting, but actually this operative administrative tasks when done very well and smoothly, can make or break alumni engagement, just saying. And then regular reports, meaning people love stories and people don't wanna read all these lengthy, whatever newsletters that don't mean anything to them. But if you show stories in a video or, or photos and these stories have impact from education, that will really also inspire alumni to remain engaged. And then a structured engagement mechanism which I think most of schools already have an alumni association that has an office, a venue to engage with university officials on important issues, and then representation in the board of trustees and in strategic planning. And then finally, donor cultivation, engagement, and management, which is really, I think, you know, um, almost part of this cycle of collaboration and partnership and a way to give back to the university. And donation, I will say, is not only in terms of money. It could also be time. It could be expertise. I've only got two minutes, and I wanted to spend that by ending with this very important um, reflection that I think all of you already know, but I'll say it anyway, that uh, because col collaboration and partnerships take time, it is important that they be embedded into the system of universities, that we build that culture of collaboration and partnership. And you will see in here some of the best practices that you can do, both internal and external. And if you notice, it starts with know what you need, right? Have the humility to know what do you need to start the conversation around creating that culture. And that culture creation includes integrating it into the practices that advance the university's mission. And then policies and procedure that actually facilitate development of these partnerships 
creating an office will really help either for strategic partnerships or for the alumni. And then hiring competent staff who will assume the work and who will be the frontliners of what you intend to do. I hope that uh, this short of 15 minutes sharing with you guys has been insightful and that I've been able to open uh, so much of what you already know, but also create the space for more reflection and probably a conversation starter on how to better I, the collaboration and partnership that you already do. Dagang salamat for this opportunity and God bless you all. Wow, magnificent. That was wonderful, Attorney Myrish. That was informative and it really compelled us to reflect in many ways. And if uh, you allow me to share mine, I do agree no, that no one sector can do it alone. And I love the fact that there's really a zeroing in on the on the concept that for every challenge there is an existing solution and it's better solved together and i think it's really a worthwhile it's a noteworthy point that's a good reminder actually that partnerships could also pose risks there are risks involved and therefore due diligence trust and transparency are truly critical it also made me reflect that Partnerships have to be built with so much prudence because the goal is to offer solutions, not to widen the gaps. Um, Attorney Myrish, I also appreciate of having an ex exit strategy because at some point, members of the partnerships grow and we dyna dynamically respond to the changing symphonies of time. And I cannot agree further when Attorney Myrish said that Suleiman University has a magnificent linkage with its alumni. We treat them as part of the family and we always look forward to their coming home, bringing stories of inspirations, failures, and successes, stories how Suleiman's spirit made them better people and men, better members of the society. Once again, that's attorney Myrish Kadapan Antonio, the Senior Director of the Fellowship's Global Initiatives Legatum Center for Development and Entrepreneurship, MIT. Reminders for our participants, please don't forget to write down your questions for each speaker at the Q&A box. We will collect these and address them during the plenary insightful session. We're down to our third speaker and I cannot wait to introduce her. Ms. Suzanne Antoinette Lou Bascara graduated from Suleiman University with a degree in accounting and placed 16th in the CPA board examinations. She finished her master's degree in business at the Ateneo Graduate School and is currently taking up her PhD in business at Suleiman University. She worked as an auditor, a banker, and a software project manager before coming home to Dumaguete to set up the very first business process outsourcing company in the province. She is the assistant vice president and site director of Inspiro Rilaya Incorporated and is currently the president of the ICT Association, where most of the BPOs and information technology colleges in the provinces are members. She is the wife of Doc Anton, mother mother of two teenage boys and a mother to three fur babies. Ladies and gentlemen, Miss Suzanne Antoinette Lou Bascara. Good morning and happy Friday. I hope you can see my slides now. We see it, ma'am. All right. Okay, so let me start with the story. Last month, I saw a post on Facebook from my elementary school seatmate, Lemuel, who is now Mayor Acosta of Oroqueta City. He was visiting the Luz Auditorium with his wife, who was also an, a Suleiman alumni. I arranged to meet with the mayor, and over breakfast, I asked him if he had any plans of bringing BPO jobs to his city. And I was delighted to hear that this was actually one of his goals during his administration. His challenge, though, was that he needed guidance to make this happen. So I shared with him how we made Dumaguete a success story from a sleepy university town to a mainstay in the list of next wave cities. 
and employing 13,000 BPO professionals. I reached out to our contacts in the National ICT Confederation or the NICP, and we introduced him to Ms. Steph Caragos, the ICT president of Cagayan de Oro, the lady here in Plaid. Um, and we asked um, Steph to mentor them well. I'm happy to report that they are now working on setting up an ICT council in Oroqueta. More and more cities outside Metro Manila and Metro Cebu are seeing the advantages of having an active BPO industry in their locality. Visionary mayors like Mayor Acosta are finding ways to achieve the trifecta, that is talent, infrastructure, and adequate support from both the government and private sectors. Now, if you're wondering why there's a lot of attention on the BPO, or now referred to by its broader term, ITBPM, or Information Technology Business Process Management Industry, consider this. According to Grandview Research, the worldwide business process outsourcing market is estimated at 245 billion US dollars. That was in 2021. And it's predicted to increase at 9.1% annual growth rate from 2022 to 2030. The IBPAP or the IT and Business Process Association of the Philippines reported during the Innovation Summit that was just held a couple of days ago that there are more than 1.4 million employees in the IT BPM sector, generating about 30 billion US dollars in annual revenue. Moreover, the Philippines has captured around 15 to 20% of the global outsourcing market. Outsource Accelerator and Outsourcing Advisory for the Philippines estimates that our industry contributes 11% to the GDP. In the past decade or two, most of the outsourcing jobs were in the customer service space. Companies in the US and in Europe use outsourcing as a business strategy, mainly to take advantage of lower labor and operating costs. In recent years though, foreign companies are observed to increasingly choose to achieve operational excellence by leveraging in the Philippines, having a highly talented and flexible workforce. We all know that Filipinos are popular for high levels of English proficiency, both written and spoken. This invaluable skill is coupled with a neutral accent. or the ability to adopt to different accents, which is an absolute delight to customers. Our workforce is also known for our cultural awareness, which stems from historically being exposed to the Spanish, Japanese, the Americans, the Chinese, and this has worked to our favor, especially when performing customer facing roles. Another trend in our industry is the outsourcing of back office operations like accounting, human resources and information technology functions. We are also seeing lucrative trends in uh, legal, medical, nursing and science disciplines. These are called knowledge process outsourcing or KPO which only provides, and not only provides very, very attractive remuneration packages, but also enables these professionals access to future trends in their respective fields of study as they work for and alongside the best companies and organizations in the world. So with less than a quarter of the worldwide market, the Philippine ITBPM industry has massive potential and we should harness this potential through strategic and collaborative collaborations. Let me now focus on three present day challenges and how the AAIG alliances can forge on these. These challenges are unemployment, migration, and technological disruption. Did you know that? The unemployment rate for Central Visayas at 8.04% is well above the national unemployment rate, which is currently at 6.37 as of January. We could then hypothesize that this is due to the lack of opportunities in the provinces. But actually, the Public Employment Services Office, or PESO, held a job fair exclusively for BPOs at the Robinson's 
Mall here in Dumaguete last Saturday, where more than 1,000 jobs were up for grabs. Sadly, only a few hundred applications were accepted. I am thus reminded of an article published uh, over the Business Inquirer last May, where initial findings of a survey conducted by the, the Board of Investments, the BOI, indicate that a number of college students are not prepared enough for jobs in certain subsectors of the, I, the ITBPM industry. So allow me now to share what Inspiro Relaya, the company I work for, has done to help address this. We recently entered into a memorandum of agreement with the DepEd here in Dumaguete and trained 20 of their TLE and English teachers who are handling conduct center services classes to senior high students. Our in-house trainers train them in the techniques and best practices that we in the industry do. Aside from the usual comm skills, call handling skills, we emphasize to the teachers the business side of a call center, how it earns, how absenteeism and staffing issues affect the bottom line, and how the proper work ethics and a positive attitude goes a long way into succeeding in the job. Furthermore, we have augmented the classroom learning with an immersion plan where the students are invited into our workplace so that they can experience the actual job for themselves. With this industry academe alliance, we are expecting a better skilled group of graduates when the school year ends. Let's look at migration. A couple of decades ago, the talent from the provinces would relocate to big cities like Manila and Cebu. I should know because I used to be one of them. This voluntary migration has also become more prevalent as we witness individuals and their families leaving their homes and their loved ones to live and work in the US, in Canada, or in Australia, mostly stimulated by economic factors. More and more, we are seeing Filipinos move to where work is available. I read in an article that increased mobility while enabling skilled people to engage globally results in an elite distance from their own communities of origin. We see towns filled with the very old and the very young living relatively well, thanks to foreign remittances, but said towns lack the vigor and vitality of having people of employable age living among them. But when we have tier two or tier three cities, smaller municipalities hosting BPO companies, we happily note that they get to keep everyone living in and contributing to the society. We get to keep the best and the brightest minds in our communities, allowing them to help the government and contribute to nation building. At the height of the pandemic alone, our industry sustained the economies of the communities we were located in. The ITBPM employee continued to work either on site or at home, continued to earn, and continued to contribute even with mobility restrictions. On the third challenge of technological disruption, with the emergence and rise of information technology, and especially with artificial intelligence, our world has experienced disruption at an unprecedented scale and pace. If you're coming from an agricultural province like Negros Oriental or a manufacturing province like Cebu, it will only be a matter of time when we might see job losses as more and more menial jobs are being automated or performed by robots. This situation will take its toll on lower skilled workers and on poorer local economies. I often get this question of, will call center agents become obsolete and replaced by chatbots and intelligent virtual agents? The industry response to this is to upskill and reskill the workforce. With our human touch and our creative minds, people are essentially hard to replace. We just need to be strategic in working with technology. Other disruptive technologies we are seeing in the workplace include 3D printing, 5G and improved connectivity, machine learning, virtual and augmented reality, the work from home revolution, big data analytics, and a lot more. It is the ITBPM industry players working directly with large companies like Google, Facebook, IBM, Microsoft, to name a few, 
who have the capability to understand these disruptive technologies, some of which might only be used in first world countries, but thanks to outsourcing, the knowledge, the processes are acquired and brought to our shores. So the value proposition of the ITBPM sector to the workforce is simple. Professional, world-class, high-paying jobs with perks and incentives in a friendly working atmosphere right in your hometown. The value proposition of the ITBPM sector to the community are ample job opportunities for everyone without emitting pollution or destroying natural resources. You know, a 4,000 square meter facility can easily house 2,500 employees and bring in a cash influx of at least 40 million pesos a month in salaries alone. Imagine this amount of money being poured into the local economy and sustaining food, real estate, consumer goods and services, and auxiliary industries. And imagine the exponential growth if through strategic and meaningful alliances between our four sectors, this will result into more high level outsourced jobs sent over to the Philippines. Therefore, let me propose the following to support this alliance. For the academe, to be open to the possibility of its graduates, even those in the hard sciences and the medical fields to work in the BPO and KPO space and engage in curriculum consultations to accommodate industry needs. For the alumni who are at the top of their respective fields to continue to support their alma mater through lectures, talks, sharing of new technology. For alumni who are um, in industry to provide relevant immersion and on the job experiences and opportunities for students to be able to feel real world scenarios for government to provide clear direction, leadership, and targets, and empower its different agencies to use its resources, to use its reach, to bring the different stakeholders together to build programs that will upskill the labor force. And for industry to open its doors and show the other stakeholders what it's like to work in our centers. I'm sure some of you here have never been inside a a BPO office. These are pictures of our site here in Bagakai. And for industry to willingly share its knowledge of what today's customer needs and the technologies that they use. ITBPM companies need to break these needs down in terms of hard skills and soft skills and partner with the academe to include these in the curriculum. If the preferred future is one where every citizen is working in a well-paying job that makes good use of his or her talents without having to migrate, then we all need to rally behind the IBPAP's five-year plan to add 1.1 million new jobs and achieve an annual revenue of 59 billion US dollars by 2028. How we get there and how soon we get there will depend greatly on how well we prepare the talent pool. The leaders in the industry are ready to partner with the academe and the government to make this happen. So a lot of figures, a lot of points to ponder. Let me leave you with this. Cooperation is the thorough conviction that nobody can get there unless everybody gets there. Daghang salamat o mayong adlaw sa atong tanan. Wow, what a wonderful presentation from uh, Miss Suzanne. Daghang salamat, ma'am, for that insight mo, insightful and amazing presentation. And um, it's really something no, that we have to um, seriously uh, think that uh, we are a top outsourcing destination, not only because we are talented and we have so much flexibility, as well as the English proficiency and this high cultural awareness, but I think uh, we Filipinos in general have, have a really uh, a different touch when it comes to service. And I like the point that uh, also emphasized here that the, BOs, the BPO sector is not only 
a BPO company lang. But it's as, as we have heard and learned, it has major contribution to the economy and have been giving invaluable service to many. And indeed, we are confronted with many challenges like unemployment, migration, and evil, and even digital disruption. And so my take on this is that partnerships between industry and academia increases the authenticity of learning because students are able to see the actual setups and context in the real-life scenarios. And indeed, technological disruption is something major. This is a call to the academia and government and even other sectors to future-proof in this VUCA world, which is volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. Once again, dagang salamat, Miss Suzanne Antoinette Lou Bascara. Reminders for our participants, please don't forget to write down your comments, your questions for each speaker at the Q&A box. We will collect these and address them during the plenary insightful session. At this juncture, allow me to introduce our next speaker. Assistant Secretary Dominic Rubia Tutay performs advisory functions to the Office of the Secretary and the lineup offices within the Workers' Welfare and Protection Cluster. She assists in ensuring the implementation and advancement of just and humane working conditions and terms of employment, promotion, and amelioration of the welfare of workers through policy and program development and conduct of research. Her key role in enforcing general label standards, occupational safety standards, social legislations, and other laws and regulations on working conditions includes formulation and development of policies, programs, and implementing rules and regulation, and operating guidelines to protect and promote the rights and welfare of workers with special concerns as well as workers in vulnerable situation, particularly toward enhancing their capacities and opportunities for productive, remunerative, and decent work. For almost nine years, her main duty centered on facilitating access of Filipino job seekers to local employment opportunities through policy researches, strategy development, labor market analysis, and provision of technical assistance to the national, regional, and local development partners. She was also responsible in developing new rules and regulations responsive to labor market changes such as human capital development, local recruitment, and employment of foreign nationals. At the height of the COVID-19 pandemic, she actively engaged the national government and the labor and employer sector and the international development partners in measures towards the economic recovery under the banner of National Employment Recovery Strategy, or NERS, which was institutionalized by virtue of Executive Order Number 140, Series of 2021. She's a guest lecturer in the Professional Certificate course on Global Migration of the University of the Philippines and Center Internacional de Formation des Autorites et Leaders, or the CIFAL, in the, and in the Global Academic Leadership Program of the Commission on Higher Education and the Asian Institute of Management. She finished her Master of Development Planning degree, Dean's Commendation for High Achievement Award at the University of Queensland, Australia, Master of Arts degree, major in development education at the University of Santo Tomas, Manila, and Bachelor of Mass Communication, cum laude, at Suleiman University. Ladies and gentlemen, I give to you Assistant Secretary Dominic Rubia Tutay of the Department of Labor and Employment. Good day, everyone, and thank you for the opportunity to share in this community of champions and advocates. My sincerest gratitude to my alma maters, the Suleiman University and the Graduate School of the University of Santo Tomas. My presentation covers the following areas. An introduction of the country's building blocks of the labor force to set the context. 
then we can have a glimpse of the disruptive labor market driven by digital age and continuous greening of the economy as part of our commitment in achieving our sustainable development goals. And finally, our skills agenda in the 21st century labor market. To start with, let me walk you through a brief overview of the country's labor force so we can better understand the labor market and how it is shaped and influenced by education and training outcomes. The country's population stands at about 110.8 million as of 2021, based on the estimates of the Population Commission or POPCOM. Of the total population, we derive the working age population 15 years old and over which accounts for about 76.5 million. In the Philippines, our minimum employable age is 15 years old. From the total working age population, most are economically active, or those employed and unemployed, and some economically inactive, or those who are full-time students, stay-home housewives, retirees, among others. By educational attainment, data shows that the highest educational attainment of the most number of the country's labor force is junior high school. This is the trend even years back, but hopefully will improve in the coming years and decades. But given this situation, the challenge to our education and training sector is how to make our labor force, mostly in junior high school, skilled and meet industry demands. The data shows that for employed youth, most of them are in elementary occupations or unskilled category. Occupations in this group involve the performance of simple and routine tasks, which may require the use of handheld tools and considerable physical effort. This is followed by service and sales workers or those that provide personal and protective services related to travel, housekeeping, catering, personal care, or protection against fire and unlawful acts, or demonstrate and sell goods in wholesale or retail shops and similar establishments, as well as at stalls and on markets. Given this data, we have to rethink if our investment in human capital is reaping the desired outcomes in the labor market. It also helps us reflect the kind and quality of employment that is created by the economy. The labor market, dynamic as it is, is affected by a number of factors. One is demography or the characteristics of a population such as its size, age, density, growth, and distribution. Second is globalization, or the transfer of information between companies and countries has created new areas of work and occupations, making mobility of workers across borders easier. Third is education and training, which dictates the availability or non-availability of skills, talents, or professions required by the industry. If there are too few trained personnel, the skill shortages will result. If there are too many, they will not find work in their chosen field. Fourth is technological change. It has resulted in the shift of jobs from one sector to another. And this results in the requirements for new skills to do the job. Finally, the government policy. It influences the labor market. Sound policy acts as enabler, for attracting investments and creating employment opportunities. According to the Organization for Economic and Cooperation Development, or OECD, having more education, knowledge, and skills increases the chance of finding employment, of improving skills while on the job, therefore of remaining employed, and of releasing higher earnings or realizing higher earnings over a lifetime. Just like in any ordinary market, the employment prospects of the seller, which is being referred to as the job seekers, depend largely on whether the goods or services 
referring to the skills, competencies, or expertise being sold meet the requirements of the buyer, herein referred to as the employers or the industry. Skills competencies come with a price. The more skilled and experienced you are, the better bargaining position you will have in the labor market. The OECD posits that in an increasingly knowledge-based global economy, people with high-level skills are in greater demand, while those in the lower-level skills are more likely to be at risk of being unemployed, especially during periods of economic downturn. Besides high-level skills typically associated with tertiary education, a well-skilled labor force also requires mid-level trade, technical, and professional skills, often delivered through vocational programs. Research has shown that the skills more highly on demand nowadays, particularly information processing skills, are learnable. Thus, it is important that both formal and alternative schooling be tuned to the current needs of the marketplace so that students of today are better prepared for tomorrow's jobs. The country's workforce is caught in a rapidly changing, uncertain, paradoxical, and tangled world of work. Disrupted by the dual impact of health crisis and automation brought about by the fourth industrial revolution. The pandemic has accelerated the adoption of new technologies and improved communication and interconnectivity and allowed large scales and integrated automation of industrial processes. These have corresponding structural changes and trends in the labor market, including the rise of remote or hybrid work, the gig economy and digital careers, the need for retooling and upskilling and distance blended learning. On top of the digital transformation crossroads, the destructive repercussions of climate change likewise requires a paradigm shift in our approach to the promotion of both quantity and quality of jobs. Promoting green jobs is imperative in addressing climate change, accelerating the transformation of economic development models, and facilitating green growth, low carbon, and sustainable development. These green economic shifts require alignment in education, skills development and training with the requirements of the labor market and also of the green and greener sectors. There is a challenge to strategize environmental education and skills development in anticipation of a paradigm shift in the industrial, agricultural and services sectors, including the greening of communities that are vulnerable to climate change risk. We behave today as we did in the past century. It is not really a problem if the world did not change, but it has and it continues to do so. As some would say, the only constant in this world is change. During the 20th century, the center of work was the job itself. Managers and supervisors tell us what to do, how to do it, and when. With the significant changes around us, we must therefore shift our paradigm, our perspective, and adapt to the new world, to the new normal. The 21st century world of work, the worker becomes the focal point rather than the work itself. The manager or the supervisor tells us, give me the right people and I can accomplish whatever you want or need. With a Generation Z and millennials driving the global labor market in the very near term, it is important to note that these cohorts place more value in opportunities to learn new skills. It is therefore imperative that academe and industry must strengthen their partnerships to develop new skills needed for the jobs of the future. Following the labor market intelligence gatherings and the priorities of the current administration, the following have been identified as key employment generating sectors or KEGs. 
These are the sectors that have the potential to generate more employment in the near and long term. Note that across these kegs, both the hard and soft skills are critical in the in-demand and hard to fill, including emerging occupations. In 2017, The Economist bannered this story about data being the new oil and therefore become the world's most valuable resource. The phrase data is the new oil was originally coined by a British mathematician, Clive Humby. This analogy has been proven correct in today's digital realm. Everything is about information from a process data using technology. Data now powers entire industries and holds tremendous value. But if left unrefined, just like oil, data also becomes effectively worthless. We are currently living in the fourth industrial revolution, and the digital realm drives us to technological developments involving high-speed mobile internet, AI or artificial intelligence, and automation the use of big data analytics and cloud technology. This made significant impact on global labor market. In the digital realm of the 21st century labor market, compounded by the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic in the world of work, significant gap between skill supply and demand requires urgent attention as most economies globally are poised toward full recovery. Making skills truly become currency of the labor market, the government, industry, and academe must seriously take into consideration the following skills agenda. First, rethink public policy and focus on building skills to promote inclusion, enhance social mobility, and alleviate poverty. Second, align skills to the work of the future. This requires transparency on which skills are most needed and most valued to ensure employability of the future workforce. Third, tailor upskilling or reskilling for identified skills gap in our current workforce. Fourth, revitalize talent mobility. This does not only mean moving people to jobs inter or intra organization but also moving jobs to people where tasks can be performed anywhere or remotely. And finally, we cannot overemphasize the value of lifelong learning to safeguard the employability of our people. The World Economic Forum has defined a set of 21st century skills to address the skills gap and equipping our learners and workforce succeed in the ever-changing and ever-evolving digital labor market. Traditional academic learning must be reinforced strongly with crucial social and emotional learning where 21st century skills are developed and acquired. And this would comprise of the following. Foundational literacies, which would refer to core skills where learners can apply in their everyday tasks such as numeracy, literacy, scientific literacy, information, communications, and technology literacy, financial, and cultural, and civic literacy. Competencies which would demonstrate how learners approach complex challenges. This include critical thinking and problem-solving skills, creativity, collaboration, and communication. Finally, character qualities which define learners' response to changing environment. Adaptability, initiative, leadership, and grit are included in these character qualities. In closing, the government, industry, and academe play a key role in enhancing the employability and skill sets of our graduates. We have to put in place mechanisms for collaboration, cooperation, and implementation. Some of these initiatives include the Philippine Qualifications Framework. It is a quality-assured national system for the development, recognition, and award of qualifications 
based on standards of knowledge, skills, and values acquired in different ways and methods by learners and workers of the country. This is in collaboration with DepEd, TESDA, CHED, the PRC, and the Department of Labor and Employment. No less than the DepEd with Vice President Sara Duterte heading the Philippine Qualifications Framework National Coordinating Council. And soon the council will identify representatives from the economic and industry to sit in the council and really look forward to a real working mechanism to advance the implementation of the PQF. Its implementation enhances workers' employability by ensuring their qualifications are relevant to the social and economic needs. In addition, the framework supports the national and international mobility of Filipino workers. The adoption of national standards and the development and maintenance of qualifications, pathways, and equivalencies allow learners and workforce to move easily and readily between the education and training sectors within their fields in the labor market. Second, or another parallel initiative towards workforce development is the Philippine Skills Framework. This provides key information on sector and employment, career pathways, occupations, or job roles, as well as existing and emerging skills required for upgrading and mastery. The Philippine Skills Framework, or PSF, aims to create a common skills language for individuals, employers, and training providers and facilitates skills recognition and support the design of training programs for skills and career development. I hope that this presentation contributes to the broader discussion of really enhancing employability and skill sets of our graduates and stimulates a whole of society approach towards the preferred future of the country's workforce. Maraming salamat po. Daghang salamat, Assistant Secretary uh, Tutay. I hope you all enjoyed her amazing presentation. And indeed, you know, there's really a trend right now you know, that data is the new oil. And the thing about oil is that once it is discovered in the earth, an oil corporation you know, generally knows what procedures to take to turn that oil into profits. It is... Uh, to drill, extract, refine, and sell that oil. But when working with data, it is far from obvious how to turn that data into money. And therefore, this is actually one of the challenges no? in terms of data privacy and how do we cope with the changing times. It's also uh, good to take note uh, sec uh, Assistant Secretary's emphasis on instilling a mindset of lifelong learning and uh, coming up no, with the foundational literacies, competencies, character qualities. And I think all of this align with Silliman University's mission, vision, and goal and our tagline, building competence, character, and faith. Indeed, promoting a total human development among our learners. And I think it's a great way to end by making sure that we align and attune to the Philippine Quality Framework and Philippine Skills Framework and even to the Southeast Asian uh, Quality Frameworks and of the other accords that can be contributory to our synergies. Once again, that's Assistant Secretary Dominic Rubia Tutay of the Department of Labor and Employment. Once again, reminding our participants to don't forget, write down your questions for each speaker at the Q&A box. We will collect these and address them during the plenary insightful session. Oh my goodness, we are down to our last but not definitely the least speaker for this caravan series of AAIG. Allow me to introduce our next uh, speaker. Our next speaker is an emeritus professor of the Institute of Environmental and Marine Sciences of Silliman University. 
He's also a visiting professor of the School of Environmental Science and Management of the University of the Philippines, Los Baños. He's an eminent fellow and member of the Academic Council of the Development Academy of the Philippines. He used to be the chair of the Coordinating Council of Private Educational Associations of the Philippines, or COCOPEA. He also was the former president of the Association of Christian Schools, Colleges, and Universities in the Philippines. He used to be member and vice chair of the Association of Christian Universities and Colleges in Asia. Ladies and gentlemen, the 12th president of Suleiman University, Dr. Ben S. Malayang III. Dr. Ben? Thank you very much. Um, let me share my screen. Okay. Okay. Uh, thank you very much again. And uh, it's nice to be the last. Uh, you get to learn a lot from the eminent uh, presenters that we have had so far. and. Uh, and I thank them for the insightful insights that they shared with us. Uh, I think that what I have here is simply a small contribution and addition to what they had already all said. So I like to do take uh, give you my take on a proposed education 4.0 framework for the Philippines. Uh, let me start with what I think education is, uh, at least education to me. Education to me is to facilitate and empower persons to develop their abilities in four areas that make them total persons. First area, the first area is analytics, and I think our previous speakers uh, talked to this. Uh, and this is the ability to think well. The second area uh, would be aesthetics, the ability to feel and to appreciate things well. The third area is ethics, the ability to decide well. And of course, the fourth area is mechanics, the ability to do things well. I just use the word mechanics here. Now, so these areas uh, in terms of curriculum uh, encompass the following. Uh, when you talk of analytics, usually this would be uh, in the curriculum reflected by uh, courses in mathematics, philosophy, logic, and science. The area of aesthetics uh, would be represented in the curriculum in the courses on arts, culture, nature, appreciation of nature, and of course, recreation. The area of ethics would be represented in the curriculum on those courses that try to develop and try to surface the critical functions of morals, spirit, spirituality, philanthropy, and civics. And of course, the fourth area of mechanics would be those that are usually represented in the curriculum by the courses in athletics, health, and skills and craft. Uh, some people call that now the technical and vocational education. So if a person, uh, a person, I think a total person must have at least uh, the, all these four competencies uh, in, in, in that person. And the, the role of education is to uh, facilitate their ability to develop these areas in their competencies. I used the word previously in the slide that I had presented to you earlier, I mean, that I submitted, endow with. And education is not to endow people with these skills. Education is to facilitate and empower them to be able to develop these skills and these areas of competencies in them. So that's a different thing. Right now, the attitude of schools is that the students are a tabula rasa, and we have to fill the gaps in what they know. But I think that the, 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 real, the real function of schools is to facilitate and empower them to be able to discover and develop these areas of competencies in their own lives and in their own, in their own professional undertakings. So I see that uh, this will not be a good product of education. A person with good competencies in being able to do things, being able to appreciate things, being able to analyze things, but very low in terms of ability to 
to to be ethical with what he or she is doing ability to decide this this will not be this is a, some kind of a uh, imbalanced type of educational outcome this also is not this kind of person that we would like to develop as a success story of education uh, very good in aesthetics very good in ethics but not being able to do much things and certainly not being able to analyze things or think for himself or for herself and always dependent on what others think for them and this too is not uh, the kind of good outcomes or indicative of a good education when you develop people with very high competencies to analyze things very bright in mathematics philosophy logic and science but somehow are not able to appreciate culture and the arts are, are 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 not even competent in appreciating poetry and literature or not being able to do much so this is not the the a, a big indication of a good successful education this one is the one that i have in mind that a person that has good capacity to think to analyze to ask questions ability to appreciate things and being able to uh, to feel how other people feel being able to decide well and balanced in terms of ability to to uh, do what is right and what is wrong uh, to 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 reject what is wrong to do what is right respective of what kind of pressures are on this person and to do things not just wait for others to do things for themselves this is the kind of uh, a, a successful education is one that is able to make the person uh, uh, em empower the person and facilitate the person being able to develop all of these competencies uh, in himself or herself now what to me is education 4.0 uh, if i might just simplify things uh, in my understanding, and I could be very, very wrong in this, and others may want to disagree with, with me, uh, but uh, my appreciation is education 1.0 is the analog type of education where you have the traditional face-to-face -face occurring in space and time and uses physical materials uh, as instruction to, to develop, uh, to develop the, uh, the persons, uh, physical artifacts to present things as a way of making people learn. Education to zero is digitization. It's really, it, it, it is the kind of face-to-face, -face, still face-to-face, -face, and uses physical artifacts, but then convert many of the physical artifacts to electronic media, such as pedagogy. Uh, pedagogy as, uh, as, as is. The pedagogy is the same, face-to-face, uh, the, the, the learning facilitator or the teacher is in front of the students and then the, the facilitator tells the student what to think and what to say and what to what to know but then uses some of this electronic media to to boost that ability to teach the but education 3.0 involves digitalization which is different from digitization Digitalization is when you transform learning with advanced ICT. You learn across space and time, and you involve larger bulks of data and information. Students and learners and, uh, and the, uh, the learning facilitators or teachers are able to access and utilize bulk data and information as part of the learning process. Uh, we have seen this in terms of what happened during COVID and uh, many schools, including Seleman, went into this uh, kind of mode of teaching across space and time using ICT as a way of engaging learners and learning facilitators. But Education 4.0 to me is when you involve digital ecosystems, which are a complex network of stakeholders that connect online and interact digitally in ways that create value for all. So this is, this, this is not the same as digitalization. A digital ecosystem is when what is virtual is almost made real and what is real is also uh, 
easily transform to what is virtual. And the line between virtual and real uh, gets, uh, gets blurred so that through virtual means, the interaction between learners and learning facilitators and stakeholders to the learning process uh, are able to interact together. And what do I mean by that? Uh, this is, uh, first, let's just say that uh, this is a representation of how from analog to digital ecosystems that allowed learning process to, to now be possible. And the, when, when we have a, a learning process that is anchored on a platform of digital ecosystems, this is what I think qualifies for what is a smart school, a smart school. Now, what is a smart school? It's really like this. Uh, a smart school is when you have digital ecosystem, uh, di digital ecosystems, not only within the school, but also together with other sectors of society. And high here, uh, uh, you have uh, the learner and the learning facilitator within the school, the inner yellow box, uh, yellow circle, and they are all trying to facilitate the acquisition and development of analytics, aesthetics, ethics, and math mechanics among the learners. And not only learners, the learning facilitators themselves start to develop and learn more because of this interaction with learners. But other than that, they're also interacting with, say, industry, uh, with faith organizations, with government and institutions, with other schools, with other schools, like what Myrish was talking about in Boston, with, with labor industries, with farming and agriculture industries, with nature and environmental, uh, and environmental advocates. All of these things are happening and, uh, and there are, there are learners and learning facilitators in these institutions that these schools interact with. So I call it a smart school system. It's not just a smart school, it's a smart school system. Learning and learning facilitators are not only within the confines of the school, but also their close interaction with industry, with labor organizations, with faith organizations, with nature and agricultural organizations, all of these things are happening so that learning and learning facilitators happen in all of these institutions as well. So interaction, the students interacting with faith institutions like church leaders and church practitioners and, uh, and, and leaders in, uh, in, 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 you know, uh, in government, they are, able to, they are able to learn from each other. Uh, you, you are not confined to the teachers you have in your school, but your interaction with industry allows you to learn from industry and industry learns from you. In Silliman, they call this uh, service learning. But I'd like to expand the whole notion of service learning, not just to learn from small communities, but learn from industry, from churches, from faith organizations, from government organizations. So the student, because of digital ecosystems link up with all of these institutions, there is a continuing exchange of both money and data, finance and data, my meaning to say, um, with, with respect to money, uh, faith institutions and, uh, learn, and, and industry spend money to interact with the schools. And by that, does not mean that they contribute for cash, but put time, as again, uh, what, what one of our speakers was saying, uh, again, it was Myrish, I think, need not be money, but rather than time. And so some of their managers spend time interacting with students in the school, and some of the low, lower rank staff, including janitors in industry, farmers in the farms, and mountaineering uh, organizations doing their trek, continue to interact with students and the learning facilitators within the school, and they themselves learn from the students and they themselves also facilitate learning to the students. And by learning here, I really mean not instruction, but rather facilitation of the ability of the person to develop your creative skills, your moral and ethical foundations, your aesthetics, and as well as your thing, being able to do things. This is the kind of uh, 
digital the digital 4.0 that uh, that we allows the school to go beyond the confines of the campus or of the classroom so this is a smart school system and utilizes a lot of this uh, ICT uh, in a, in a digital ecosystem way so they interact uh, with these uh, other institutions in society now of course if you have alumni in all of these institutions in society this could become the lead persons uh, in terms of engaging our learners in the school systems. And they themselves continue to learn as new things happen in the, in the world of, of learning. Now, <clears throat> but I don't, I don't want to stop there. A smart and a synergistic school system is this kind of thing that I have here represented in the screen. Meaning to say that within the school itself, there is a continuous exchange of time, money, resources, as well as data and information within the school itself, uh, within the confines of the school. I mean, I don't think schools are uh, what I call uh, wealth accumulating, uh, wealth accumulating or cash accumulating institutions. Schools are not in the business of accumulating cash and accumulating wealth. Schools are in the business of investing cash, investing information in order to create a better and bigger synergy with society at large. And so if, if, the, if the resources of the schools are not made to circulate properly and actively within the school system and continue to invest uh, on human capital, on ICT and other technology and acquisition of more information such as through research, through community engagement, that school will not be very synergistic at all. And if you are not synergistic within the school, how would you expect to be synergistic with respect to the wider spectrum of societies such as in industry, in agriculture, in the labor sector, in the faith institutions, and in the nature institutions? Uh, that allow you to, to experience what are really happening in the world out there. This is the kind of school where the ability of the students uh, to, to develop their skills in, in analytics, mechanics, in aesthetics, and in ethics would be facilitated not only by the learning facilitators within the school, but also in the wider world out there. And, uh, and in this case, students are not only listening and learning what would be uh, that would allow them to be more employable so-called uh, in the industry when they will go out of the school but rather they also help facilitate create new work and modify the work that are available in the world out there uh, I, I cannot subscribe to the idea that we have to make students uh, come to school so that then we will train them to be able to fit to the world of work out there. I subscribe to the idea that students, if facilitated well and allowed to do so, may even improve the world of work out there and may even help define the kind of world of work that we will get into if indeed they are given this, this facility. And Education 4.0 allows them to do that if the school is able to invest on connecting itself with the wider uh, array of institutions as the learning facilitators and learners of the school rather than merely the students and the teachers within the school. And more than that, if you have smart synergistic school systems interacting together as well in what I call a blockchain of smart and synergistic school systems, you have power. And here, you have power to actually change not just not just the world of work, but also change society as well. Uh, there is a there was a publication uh, in September 29, 2022, where uh, some scholars were bewailing the fact that schools seem to just be uh, producing uh, producing specializations that are esoteric to within the academic circle and they're not well connected with the realities of the world out there. And uh, they talk of culture gaps, they talk of how schools have not been able to really ride the wave of the great acceleration. 
Um, but I think that if we schools are just innovative enough and uh, daring enough to really invest on uh, digital ecosystems anchored and uh, uh, in digital ecosystem capacities and link up with institutions out there and begin to think that learning does not happen only within the school, but within society at large. And instead of sequestering students to learn only from its own faculty and staff, they learn as well from practitioners out there in the field. You have a powerful school that I think will not just be smart, synergistic, but could be blockchained with other schools of similar nature. And you will have a powerful education system for society at large. And that, to my, my friends, will be a Philippine education 4.0 should be an all of society education system. Thank you very much. Wow, thank you very much, Dr. Ben Malayang for your sharing. Indeed, no? we are all interconnected and uh, I took note of the four aspects on analytics, ethics, aesthetics, and mechanics and I think if I will have to summarize it, the smart school system highlights the symbiosis and in the words of Dr. Tan, enzymatic relationships between and among AAIG and even other sectors. And indeed, there's really education beyond that four walls. So thank you very much once again. That's Dr. Ben S. Malayang III, Professor Emeritus of Suleiman University. Reminders to our participants, Please don't forget to write down your questions for each speaker at the Q&A box. We will collect these and address them during the plenary insightful session. But before we proceed to the next segment of our caravan, let's stretch and hydrate ourselves or perhaps take a short toilet break. And for the meantime, we'll be showing short videos to acknowledge our sponsors. Welcome to the Academ Alumni Industry and Government or AAIG 2022 Caravan Series for Region 1 and CAR. The Academ Alumni Industry and Government 2022 Caravan Series is a reminder to always strive for excellence. Today's event is about expanding access to opportunities that can connect our love of learning research and service the Lindos vision to become a premier and globally competitive university. AAIG stands for Academ, Alumni, Industry and Government coming together to force strategic alliances to establish a common, innovative and collaborative approach that is sustainable and inclusive to bridge and lessen the gaps in the transition from the academe to the industry of fresh alumni, thus promoting a smooth school to work transition by implementing a work based learning continuum. For seven decades, Rex has been steadfast in its commitment to advancing lifelong learning for every Filipino. To have AIG sparking conversation on the state of our system is non-negotiable in helping us achieve our mission. Inspire every individual to advance oneself, uplift others, and sustain the environment to a better world. It is our fervent desire to champion quality higher education while being watchful the possible threats of this pandemic. I give emphasis to the importance of collaborative partnership efforts among the academe, alumni, industry, and government sectors of which the AAIG Caravan 2022 intends to accomplish. These sectors must work in harmony to attain a common goal. Generally, some of what we hope to continue achieving amidst the pandemic are as follows. 
Of course, the successful learning of competencies, whether we teach virtually or physically or a combination of both. Of course, we also have to think of reducing pandemic risks. We hope to continue with our enrollment, graduation, employments, etc. The successful implementation of these five pillars, EGASE, means the successful capacitation of our people on various skills. Resiliency and sustainability are two broad and strong terminologies when we speak about our country's development. Just as I have learned at the Dimsu Open University System that people should be at the center of the policy debate, the Senate holds on to the ancient and fundamental democratic truth that given the right circumstances, ordinary people have a substantial capacity to overcome differences and discover common ground. Collaboration is that common ground. The MSME sector is a critical driver for our country's economic growth. The sector serves as supplier and subcontractor to large enterprises and forms a strategic component of the export value chain. Thus, the need for a program that can help the micro and small enterprises become part of the growing economy and will somehow contribute in promoting transformational education. The Department of Trade and Industry endeavors to provide enabling programs to help aspiring entrepreneurs roll out his or her business and engaging smarter entrepreneurs to earn more. With the onset of the pandemic, one of the most uh, uh, important uh, office for which I uh, really uh, had been very, very close to is uh, the MSWD. And of course, what really made us uh, be the best versions of ourselves was during the pandemic where, you know, every now and then we get to have uh, a glimpse of what really is to be COVID affected. So with the MSWD office, I was able to share daily daily activities with them uh, distributing food packs to all uh, covid stricken families in the municipality the aaig story started three years ago it started with a simple dream of putting together that's what we call it coming together of the four important strategic partners that could spell transformative education. The story will not end there, for we shall be having a lot of stopgap activities to galvanize and create a community of partners believing that only in the forging of one mind, one heart, and one soul can we truly achieve an elusive dream that has been there for so long a time the dream of having quality education in the hearts and minds of the Filipino people. From this gathering, we really hope that we will be able to discover in the near or far future models of partnership between the government, particularly the Senate and the DTI, and the local government and the colleges and universities because we hope that we will all be able to pursue a community of practice where we will promote always the conversation among the four sectors. Let us all as a collective express the clarion call to have education-driven leaders in our midst to be one with us in making our nation a true education nation. Let us continue to build robust education ecosystems and communities of practice where spirited and dynamic conversations flourish, ensuring fast incubation and birth of more pathways towards inclusive success. Go, 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 go
Okay. Nyo. And then... Di ba may assignment ka na dapat ipasa ngayong hapon? Ako muna dyan, hoy! Ako muna, ako muna. Sige, sige na. Nagsisimula na yung basketball. Yan! Yeah! Ano ba dyan nyo? Umayos na nga. Huwag kang parara dyan. Ma, nanana dyan. Ma'am, excuse ka. Oh, nabasa ko na yung case study. Kita nyo, may meeting ako dito. Nakakahiya ako. Ito, oh, sa device penal ko. Tumahimik kayo dyan. Hoy! Hoy! Hindi na tayo na... Siya na na... Okay ka lang? Pipi! Bakit? Bakit ka ba? Bakit hindi ko nagagawa sa inyo? Diyan na, hindi ka na, ito ko, kaya ka lang eh! Nangyari, anak! Anak, ano nangyari sa'yo? There you go, ladies and gentlemen. I hope you enjoyed your short break. You're able to drink some water to keep you fresh and, of course, enthusiastic. And uh, I just can't really put into words how this experience so far for me has uh, has been um, incredible. It was excellent, amazing, insightful. I mean, name all of. Uh, adjectives in the roster. Uh, we are truly blessed to have our speakers and we are learning so much. And I think we have truly achieved our goal, our purpose of um, organizing this event. At this juncture, we're going to proceed to the plenary insightful conversations. And this time, we will be listening to your insights, your reflections, experiences, and even questions. Allow me to call on uh, the dean of, uh, uh, or the chairman of the board of USTAAI and the AAIG main convener, Dean Henry Tenedero. Sir? Okay, thank you very much, um, Professor Joshua, for splendidly handling our conversation this morning. So, as chair of the uh, UST Alumni Association, together with our president, Dr. Evelyn Sonko, I wish to extend my heartfelt congratulations to Siliman University for being able to assemble a great team of distinguished speakers who not only eloquently, but if I may add, passionately covered well the topics at hand. As they say, maraming paraan to skin the cut. The quest for quality education has continued to be a big question to us. Bata pa lang ako, tinatanong na yan. Kaya nung kami nangarap, 
na gawin ng isang alumni association na hindi lamang isang fundraising or fellowship club, but an alumni association that will champion relevant and timely societal change, we have thought of the idea of forging together, putting together, and responding together the four main stakeholders that would define that quality education, the academy, alumni, industry, and government. We know for a fact that matagal na nagsasama yan. We have attended numerous conferences seeking the rightful answer that will make education meaningful, not only para sa mga education planners or policy makers, kung hindi para sa ating mga mag-aaral na kung saan natin inuhugot ang ating lakas para gawin ang mga bagay na ito. I'm personally impressed how Siliman University, your distinguished speakers, have put to life our desire to make AIG not only as a brand, but a synergistic, powerful brand to finally bring about quality education in our needs. From 4.0, we're moving now to 5.0 education development. We wish to humanize in the age of technology. Na yung ating platform, online discussion, hindi lang dapat siya high-tech, kailangan kita pa ay high-touch. For real learning happens not in the cognitive domain alone, but real learning happens in the hearts and minds of the human learner. In a little while, our togetherness will simply become part of your calendar date. But what we want our participants and all our stakeholders to bring home the precious moments that in your own simple but strategic desire, you can make a wonderful difference. Kung teacher ka na narito sa ating 102 participants, kung ikaw ay mag-aaral, paano mo ito isa sa buhay? Kung ikaw ay guro, paano mo ito i-integrate sa iyong curriculum? Kung ikaw ay policy decision maker, paano mo siya bibigyan ng buhay? Kaya po, walang kasagutan ang ating pagtitipan ngayon para tunay natin makita ang bukang liwayway. So, ang ating concern ngayon, Professor Joshua, yung ating oras uh, in our program, dapat tapos na ang ating talakayan, ang ating insightful impression. So, ganito po ginagawa namin. Do sa mga nagpadala sa chat box ang inyong katanungan, pinaforward po namin sila sa mga inyong gustong tanungin. And we situate na yung ating mga speakers ay sasagutin at ibabahagi ang inyong katunungan. Uh, sayang nga lang po at wala po tayong sapat ng oras, pero ganun pa man ako, kami naniniwala na in life, less is even more. We have seen during the pandemic na nawala ang face-to-face, -face, pero nagkaroon naman tayo ng heart-to-heart -heart home learning na higit natin nakilala ang bawat isa na hindi kailangan uh, 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 high-tech lahat, kailangan iba pa rin yung face-to-face -face na ating binabaybay ngayon. So sa aking uh, programa rito, Professor Joshua, meron tayong uh, na-pinpoint na tatlo magbabahagi ng kanilang impression. Sila ay sila Dr. Gina Bonyar, si Dr. Maria Victoria Violanda, at si Dr. Maria uh, Jonad Villegas. Sila po ay uh, gumawa ng pananaliksik upang ilahad nila ang kanilang saloobin patungkol sa kanilang mga narinig sa ating mga distinguished speakers. So una natin, tawagin muna si Dr. Gina Bonyar. Please come in. Maraming salamat po, Sir Henry S. Tenedero. And we really thank you and the USD alumni and the whole support team and sponsors for initiating this insightful conversation. To me, at the heart of the talks today, and that was, my students would call that nosebleed, just so much 
to take in in a few minutes. But I think at the heart of this conversation is the concept of caring through education so that together we get to our preferred futures. Caring about our nation through quality of education, Dr. B.J. Tan talks about accreditation, caring through alumni and institutional resource sharing, which was really well conceptualized by uh, attorney Myrish Kadapan Antonio, caring through academe, government, industry, and government and non-government organizations, as well as faith-based institutional collaboration. Talk of um, Dr. Ben Malayang, right? And also the talk of uh, the specialist from BPO, Ma'am Suzanne Lu, the talk of Dr. Tan expounded on how we demonstrate care through accreditation, which I learn now is a community of practice with a common goal of ensuring a quality assurance of various facets of education informed by a framework of assessment and evaluation based on agreed upon parameters and standards. So at the heart of this community of practice are the values of trust, volunteerism, partnership, so that collaboratively the community moves together towards a common preferred future, which is excellence excellence in education. Similarly, Myrish Kadapan Antonio emphasized that in any relationship, there are risks that need to be addressed. Thus, due diligence is critical. And when needed, even the legal office may be co-opted. Because in any community, in any partnership, time is of the essence. And time, partnership takes time. So it is important to know who you are engaging with, grit, with flexibility, with trust, and with care. Alumni engagement, according to Myrish, is a mutually beneficial enterprise because while it provides home for the alumni, it also provides a space for various expertise of the alumni to be shared. And this is what we are doing in this conference, right? Among these are some best practices that were shared. And what I like about what Myrish shared is the power of making connections through storytelling. And I saw that very well demonstrated in the way Ms. Suzanne Lubascara shared her talk. She started with a story. And in her narrative, you can see there the power of collaboration, networking, anchored on trust, caring, and risk-taking. Suzanne took that risk when she left that lucrative job to start a, the first BPO in Dumaguete at a time when the Philippines was not yet even known or not yet at the top of the outsourcing destinations in the world for back office service or may it be for knowledge process outsourcing services. Suzanne's story struck me in that her role and commitment in the industry are driven by a deep care for our social, economic, moral, and environmental well-being as a nation, which the Department of Labor Assistant Secretary Dominic Tutai refers to as the green and greening sectors of the industry. All of our speakers emphasize the need to rethink the school industry need alignment in light of the rapidly changing demands of the workplace, particularly investing and upskilling our students towards employment in green and greening sectors. Data is the new oil. Everything is about information from processed data using technology. However, as mentioned by the Assistant Secretary, if data like oil is unless unrefined, it becomes useless, even harmful, I may add. Thus, within the con context of instilling a mindset of lifelong learning, we need to align our skills to the work of the future, emphasizing not only employability or upward economic mobility, but more importantly, social and environmental well-being, something that Suleiman emphasizes as a thrust. This approach to education is aimed at facilitating and empowering persons to develop their abilities and dispositions 
as mentioned by Dr. Malayang, in thinking well, in feeling well, in appreciating well, in deciding well, and in doing well. So just absorbing is not enough. We need to rethink education and the whole concept of whole education, whole person education. And Education 4.4, as described by Malayang, involves these digital ecosystems that facilitate this. When what is virtual is made real and what is real is made virtual. And therefore, the line is blurred. Why? Because at the end of this all, it's all about caring. We think about those so many strategies in improving education. But the challenge is how do we create this smart school system so that education engages in a mutually beneficial interaction with the industry, with faith institutions, with government and non-government organizations towards excellence, towards this preferred future in a synergistic rhizomatic relationship. Let me end with this. At the heart of this talk this morning, again, is the concept of caring. We are here because we care. And if we think about or revision, re revisit, rethink the preferred future, it's because we care. And so in the language of Myrish, as she quoted Virginia Burden, really, we can only get there when we cooperate. A cooperation is the thorough conviction that nobody, nobody can get to that preferred future unless everybody gets there. Daghan kain salamat for this insightful, caring storytelling around these warm electronic campfire. My buntag. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Gina. Anchored in the word care. The heart of education is in the education of the human heart. Success has been redefined during the midst of the pandemic. Whereas before, we only equate it with IQ, Talino, and EQ, Uso. But the pandemic has given us the third definition, which is DQ, Discarte. So IQ, EQ, Discarte is the way we define a caring education. Bah, Dr. Gina, talaga naman, uh, impression pala yan, parang, ano na, parang state of the nation address na. So congratulations and more power. As we move to our next uh, sharer, si Dr. Maria Victoria Volanda. Please come in. Mama Ria, nakamute Hi, ko sorry. kayo. Ay, yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> Good morning once again. I'm sorry for that technical problem. Um, good morning to all the participants and to our dear speakers. I am honored and grateful that I have given this opportunity to share my insights from this talk that we have today. Um, I would like to start with holistic development. And the talk today really encapsulated how to develop holistic um, development among our learners from the partnerships of academe, alumni, industry, and government. I am really impressed by the thoughts and ideas shared by our speakers from the perspective of the academe of ensuring quality and excellence through accreditation. And of course, in engaging in these endeavors, we are promoting the sense of voluntarism and sense of regulation, or self-regulation rather, in forging partnership. And I am really inspired that in this endeavor, in the field of accreditation, that trust must be the cornerstone of partnership. As a rejoinder for the education for 4.0, I am really impressed how Dr. Ben Malayan simplified the explanation on what is the importance of industry 4.0 or education rather 4.0 of striking the balance in developing the competence among our learners and the development of smart school system wherein these stakeholders of ours can serve as our learning facilitators 
And with the development of educational or digital ecosystem, rather, this one can promote a power of change to our society, hence achieving all society education. I really love how Siliman developed their alumni because it was highlighted by the speaker that it serves as their home. How I wish all the schools can develop this sense of love for their school because through that we can have this partnership with them, this forming relationship wherein we can create effective collaboration. At the same time with the industry, the very role of industry in um, honing the further the skills of our graduates, but it is also posing a challenge to academe on how we can upskill and reskill our students so that they can just stay here and no need for them to migrate and seek greener pasture in far places. At the same time, um, I am impressed by the presentation of our speaker from the government highlighting that data is our new oil. It needs to be refined well so that it can be useful to all of us. And I am really happy to hear that Dol is encouraging the green economy or green jobs because with this, as a country, we are also aligned with the UN SDG goals and achieving it on or before 2030. With this, thank you very much. And I hope that through this talk, we can further inspire and spread holistic development among our learners. Thank you once again. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Violanda. You know, it's been at in high tech now with the visuals and high touch pa, the way she narrated her own story. So, yan ay imabanggit ko lang bago kong makalimutan. Yan ang kakaiba sa Siliman University. Meron kayong katangi-tanging kinang. No? You blend your academics with the, with the heart domain, uh, which should be, I, I agree with you, na kailangan sana ay isa puso ng bawat school. Hindi lang yung mga tinatawag na big schools, kundi yung mga small and medium-sized schools na karamihan sa kanila ay nagsara, hindi dahil hindi na niniwala sa kagitingan ng edukasyon, kundi kailangan magsara dahil sa financial na bagay, operational cost. Anyway, so thank you very much, uh, Madam uh, Maria Victoria. As we move on to another Maria, this time it's uh, let's call on Dr. Maria Janet Villegas for her thoughts. Um, good morning, everyone. So just the correction, sir, I'm not a doctor. I'm not from the academe. I'm from the ITBPM industry. Okay. So basically listening to all the speakers, um, for me, it's really collaboration. For me, indeed, collaboration is the key. And in mom, um, Susan Bascara's talk, it mentioned about um, IBPUP's plan to add 1. million jobs and to grow a revenue target of 59 billion US dollars in five years. That's a wow. And this will be a great help to the Filipino people. But to make this happen, we in the IT BPM industry need to collaborate with our stakeholders. So like us mentioned, we need the alumni, the academe, and the government. We need to focus, refocus on how we can create initiatives to respond to the needs of society, especially with regards to unemployment, migration, and technological disruptions. There are a lot of job openings in our industry, and people need to grab the opportunity. I also agree that having BPO jobs in the city reduces the pressure to work abroad to earn. My colleagues and I get to see our children grow and their families prosper without having to migrate. The jobs that we have are challenging and the technology we use are at par with our counterparts in the US and I am proud to be part of the IT BPM industry. So having said that, he can count on me and in ingenuity, the company I represent to be a avid supporter of the IIG 2022 proceedings. As active members of the ICT Association of Dumaguete and Negro Sorrental, we continue to partner with other BPO companies in the city to grow our industry. So we are looking forward to be of help or to be part of various activities platforms that will be created for the Visayas. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Miss 
Villaga. So hindi ka man doktor, pero ang iyong puso ay mahigit pa sa isang doktor. Salamat po, salamat. So gaya na sinabi namin kanina na hindi namin na uh, uh, dahil sa I'm looking at uh, yung oras ngayon, no? wala na tayong panahon para sagutin lahat ng mga na itanong sa ating chat box. So we will be forwarding them to our speakers and we'll see to it na lahat sila ay masasagot okay, ng ating mga speakers. So once again, sa ngala ng uh, UST Alumni Association, uh, taos po sa kami nagpapasalamat. And let me end with this clarion call. The clarion call is very simple. Let AIG and this partnership blossom as we continue to break down the walls of ignorance, myth, and complacency in our midst and instead build bridges of new hopes and dreams coming to life, new ways of thinking, doing, and being. Thank you very much. And we bring back the floor now to our excellent MC, Mr. Joshua Sodillo. Maraming salamat. Babalik kami sa muli at dating pagkikita. Daghang salamat. Thank you. Maraming salamat, Kabayan Henry. <laughs> Thank you so much, uh, Sir Henry, for facilitating our Insano Plenary Session. And wow, this is truly a learning experience for all of us. And at this point, we are truly uh, running out of time. Allow me to award these certificates to our speakers. And this is to show our appreciation and, of course, uh, recognition of the valuable uh, thoughts, insights, ideas that you have given to all of us. I'd like to request the tech team to flash the certificates for our speakers. Allow me to read the citation and it reads, Strengthening Approaches Towards the Preferred Future, AAIG Caravan 2022. The University of Santo Tomas, UST Alumni Association Incorporated, in partnership with the UST Graduate School Center for Continuing Professional Education and Development, and Siliman University, awards this Certificate of Appreciation to Dr. Betty uh, to Dr. Betsy Joy B. Tan, the President of the Federation of Accrediting Agencies in the Philippines, for having given, for generously sharing her expertise and uh, time for the AAIG 2022 Region 6, 7, and 8 uh, caravan. Mm -hmm. Dr. Betsy Joy mm -hmm. Tan, maraming salamat po. Naingay po si Leo, ah. The same certificate of appreciation is given to Attorney Myrish Kadapan Antonio, the Senior Director of the Fellowship in uh, MIT. Certificate of appreciation is given as well to Ms. Suzanne Antoinette Lou Bascara from uh, the uh, Inspiro Relaya Incorporated and the President of the ICT Association of Dumaguete and Negros Oriental. The same certificate of appreciation is awarded to Assistant Secretary Ms. Dominic Rubia Tutay of the Department of Labor and Employment. And of course, to the Professor Emeritus of Siliman University, Dr. Ben S. Malayang III. Maraming, maraming, maraming salamat po sa inyong lahat for sharing your expertise, your thoughts, and your foresights to all of us. At this time, for the commitment to the manifestation of solidarity, allow me to, to call Dr. Evelyn A. Songho, the president of the UST Alumni Association. Ma'am Evelyn. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, good morning or good afternoon to everybody. But first, before we say our manifestation of solidarity, allow me to thank the Siliman University for serving as a champion of AAIG in the Visayas. And of course, special thanks to the Siliman AAIG team and to our local convenor, Dr. Edna Kalingasyon. And definitely we would like to thank the Rex Education for believing in the advocacy of continuing, uh, for the advocacy of continuing conversation between and among the academe, industry, and government. You really have been supporting us all throughout this 2022 
AAIG Caravan. And definitely to our speakers, you are all great. Thank you so much. You have given us so many insights this morning. You really made this leg of the USD AAIG Caravan meaningful. You have given us, the alumni, more inspiration to continue the AAIG conversations. You have given importance to the role of the alumni in the whole spectrum of quality education. And so I believe that all of you are one with us in the desire for continuous conversation among the academic industry and government so that our graduates can have their preferred future. So therefore, at this point, allow me to invite you to join me in stating this or in saying this manifestation of solidarity. Can we move it? All right. So all together, let's say this. We, the participants of the 2022 Academe Alumni Industry and Government or AAIG Caravan held on September 30, 2022 via Zoom, hereby declare and manifest in solidarity with one another our commitment to the following statements. Whereas we are cognizant of the multiple challenges that fresh graduates experience as they search for rewarding careers in employment or entrepreneurship in today's world of work. Whereas we recognize the important roles that the academe, alumni, industry, and government play in national development and the unique contribution that each of them make in creating favorable environments and innovative pathways that enable fresh alumni in transitioning successfully from their pursuit of academic qualifications to their meaningful practice of a profession or a vocation. Whereas we believe the need for open communications, continuing engagements and joint collaborations among the academic industry and government in forging collective and alumni-centric initiatives aimed at propelling the fresh alumni toward optimized personal, professional, and economic well-being and development. And whereas we believe that the empowered alumni is a critical contributor to the nation's social capital formation and an indispensable force toward the realization of the envisioned inclusive and sustainable development of the Philippines today and well into the future. Motion, the sustainable regular staging of a national and international AAIG summit every other year. Endorse the USD Alumni Association Incorporated and the USD Graduate School Center for Continuing Professional Education shall continue to spearhead the AAIG summits with support from friends and other like-minded individuals and groups. Commit to support continuing conversations, collaborations, and initiatives with significant academic, alumni, industry, and government partners being undertaken at various levels, regional, provincial, city, municipal, or institutional to create synergies achieve successes and drumbeat widening awareness and interest leading up to the staging of the subsequent AAIG summit. Manifested this 20th, 30th day of September 2022. Maraming maraming salamat po to everyone and let us continue the AAIG contributions. Let us continue our AAIG story until we are able to come up with a smart synergistic school system that contributes to our country's educational ecosystem. Daghang salamat sa inyong tanan. 
Lovely to see you again, Professor Evelyn uh, Songko. Thank you very much for your words of manifestation of solidarity. This has been a very rich, productive, insightful, full and if I may add inspirational conversation and webinar and to formally uh, give his closing remarks may I request the Suleiman University Vice President for Academic Affairs Professor Dr. Earl Jude Paul Cleope. A pleasant day to everyone in behalf of Suleiman University our campus by the sea, it was indeed our pleasure to be the convener of the Academe, Alumni, Industry, and Government uh, Visayas Leg of the Caravan for the series of 2022. It is indeed my hope that the aim of the caravan, which is to uh, cascade the learnings of the summits and stimulate the emergence of AAIG convergence community of advocates and champions will really be achieved. So again, dagang kaing salamat and may you have a good day. Thank you very, very much. Dagang salamat. That's Professor Dr. Earl Jude Paul Cleope, our Vice President for Academic Affairs. For the final remarks, allow me to call the Director of the USD Graduate School Center for Continuing Professional Education and Development, Associate Professor Jocelyn Agkawili. Ma'am Jocelyn. Uh, thank you very much, Joshua. Okay, so as we are about to end today's webinar, which is the penultimate or the second to the last in our AEIG 2022 Caravan Series. I am very happy and thankful that you have all once again joined us in this continuing endeavor and advocacy of the UST Alumni Association and the UST Graduate School Center for Continuing Professional Education and Development for our academic industry alumni industry and government collaboration for educational transformation or simply AAIG. We do hope that you will be with us as we continue to hope, to dream, and most of all, to exert all our efforts to really transform the educational landscape in our country to make it more attuned and responsive to the signs of the times, to the needs of the industry, and to make our young alumni truly future ready. Let us continue to strengthen, solidify, and make real the enormous possibilities of alliances that foster continuous conversations and innovative pathways for strategic and sustained partnerships among the alumni, academic, industry, and government sectors for inclusive growth and success to allow us to enable the attainment of the fullest realization of the dreams and potentials of the graduating students. Today's program has been made more meaningful because it was in collaboration with one of our champions, part of our growing community of partners in AAIG, our local convener and host for today, the Siliman University in Dumaguete City, headed by its president, Dr. Betty McCann, for accepting the challenge to our AAIG champion to be our AAIG champion in the Visayas region. And of course, also to the Siliman AAIG organizing team for the very, uh, that was ably led by Dr. Edna Gladys Kalingashon. We thank you very much for all your efforts that you have extended. And we would like to show our deep appreciation for the time, the effort, and the resources that you have willingly shared. And so we would like to present this very simple certificate of appreciation. So I would like to read the Certificate of Appreciation to the Seliman University. The University of Santo Tomas Alumni Association Incorporated 
in partnership with the Graduate School Center for Continuing Professional Education and Development presents this Certificate of Appreciation to the Siliman University as local convener for the AAIG 2022 series of, at Region 6, 7, and 8, uh, given this uh, 30th day of September at Siliman University. Signed by myself as the Center uh, for Continuing Professional Education and Development Director. Also signed by Dean Henry Tenedero, Chairman of the UST Alumni Association Incorporated. And of course, our dear President, Professor Evelyn Songko. Okay, so again, thank you everyone. It, it, uh, let us now fully embrace and rise equal to the challenges that were presented to us by our uh, esteemed resource speakers. And together, let us find the opportunities in the global, global village and collectively face the VUCA environment by being visionary, dynamic, creative, liberating, and above all, transformative. And to round up our AAIG Caravan series, may I invite all of you again to join us on October 14 for the last leg of our Caravan series, which will be held in the Mindanao region to be jointly hosted by Davao del Norte State College and the Western Mindanao State University with the Zoom platform to be again provided by our generous sponsor, Rex Education. So once again, in behalf of the USD Alumni Association, AAIG organizing team, and the USD Graduate School CCPED, we thank you for your participation in today's caravan, and we hope for your sustained support and collaboration in our future endeavors for the transformation of the educational ecosystem in our country so that united we can bridge the gap between the academe and industry for the benefit of our students, our young alumni, and consequently for our entire nation. Magandang tanghali po sa inyong lahat at mabuhay. Maraming salamat, Associate Professor Jocelyn. No? Indeed, mabuhay tayong lahat. But I know you want to eat your lunch already at this point. But just before we end the webinar, I'd like to encourage all participants to fill out the evaluation form. The link of the evaluation form is already posted in our chat box. Certificates will be provided after the submission of the completed evaluation form. And if you have any questions, don't hesitate to send an email to AAIG Summit 2021 at gmail.com and to review a recording of today's webinar you may visit the FB page of USC AAI, USC GSC CPED and Silliman University and of course by Rex uh, Education. Just a reminder that the next caravan as mentioned by Mam Joy will be on October 14 for the regions of the beautiful Mindanao. I'd like to encourage everyone to attend the next webinar and invite their colleagues to participate. Thank you once again to our guest speakers for today's webinar. You would, uh, if you need more information about their presentation and biography, you can access it at the website https colon double slash usdalumniassociation.org slash AAIG 2021 summit. And big thanks to our major sponsor for this caravan, Rex Education. To give us a glimpse of the next leg of the series of this caravan, let's watch this.
there you go, ladies and gentlemen. We look forward to having you in the next leg of this caravan. And to conclude to the uh, to conclude uh, to conclude today, parang gutom na ata ako. Eh. <laughs> to conclude this webinar, we would like to invite you to join us in singing the Silliman song. And before we do that, I'd like to remind our panelists to stay after the Silliman song for the photo opportunity. And on behalf of Silliman University, our guest speakers and all members of the organizing committee, thank you very much. From the innermost chamber of our hearts, maraming salamat po. We hope you have learned you got inspired and enjoyed today's presentations. This has been Joshua Soldivillo saying, if you want to go fast, walk alone. But if you want to go far, walk with others. Have a great day. Ingat and to God be the glory.